Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies and show you how they were made. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're finally looking at Puppet Master, the beginning of the Ultimate Full Moon series, released on Glorious Home Video in 1989. I've covered Full Moon Fair like Demonic Toys and ugh, Evil Bong, but the indie film company is absolutely best known for Puppet Master, which was actually the first ever Full Moon feature. Producer Charles Band had led Empire Studios in the 80s, which made everything from Reanimator to Dolls to Ghoulies to from beyond. You know, all the good shit. Empire collapsed in 88, but Charles Band quickly regrouped and made Full Moon Entertainment, aiming to tackle the booming home video market with low-budget genre schlock. That's not derogatory, I love schlock. Also, as of right now, Full Moon has a Patreon slash loyalty club, and they're offering a special deal for dead meat fans that involve their little tiny terror figures. Stay tuned to the end of this video for more details. Puppet Master was Full Moon's first film, and it was such a success on home video that they proceeded to make the ever-loving shit out of them. Seriously, you want a franchise? This thing's got Puppet Masters 1, 2, 3, Toulon's Revenge, 4, 5, Curse of the Puppet Master, Retro Puppet Master, Puppet Master The Legacy, which you can pretty much ignore, Puppet Master vs. Demonic Toys, which yes, indeed slaps, and then an awful Axis trilogy that's just, ugh, fucking awful. There was also an unrelated reboot kind of thing with some tasteless kills and, uh, Nazis? And oh yeah, the Blade and Dr. Death spinoff films. Oh wait, there are also comic books, action figures, trading cards, and a free-to-play multiplayer game released last year on Steam. There's a lot of fucking puppet shit, okay? The first Puppet Master stands apart from its sequels by virtue of how weird it is. It's almost a Friday the 13th situation, where the franchise is more well known through its sequels. I mean, we've still got puppets killing people, but the plot is centered around a horny group of adult psychics who gather at a hotel because of their dead friend. The puppets aren't really the focal point, and are competing for screen time with a whole bunch of other weird shit. Weird horny shit. I think most fans of the series enjoy the middle sequels the most, which focus a lot more on the puppets and their creator, Andre Toulon, sometimes in the fight against Nazis during World War II. Movies like the fourth and fifth ones are a lot more fun, whereas honestly, this first one is pretty slow and boring. I mean, the two main characters are just fucking wooden planks, but at least the other cast members are doing stuff. Now, I'ma talk a lot of shit about this movie throughout the video, but please don't think that means I don't love it. I find it cozy as hell, and I love laughing at the weird parts, especially the weird horny parts. I've been a Puppet Master fan since I was a kid, and I've always wanted to come Cover them on the kill count. But I'll only be doing the first one for now. We've got to see if you all care. I hope you do, because this is the kind of stuff that made me fall in love with horror in the first place. Hopefully, you too can fall in love with Jester, Tunneler, Pinhead, Leech Woman, and their noble leader, Blade. And uh, this guy who's just in one scene. All right, hold up, get this. A bunch of psychics and a bunch of killer puppets walk into a hotel. Stop me if you've heard this one before. And the Tunneler says to the Pinhead, Whoa, whoa, whoa! Were you about to tell a puppet joke? Puppet James? You're alive? Yeah, there was a blue fairy. It was a whole thing. I know, I know. Whoa, magic is real. Blah, blah, blah. Wow, that's incredible, man. Congratulations. Are you kidding me? To exist is to suffer. But what are you gonna do? Hey, hey, don't talk like that. There's plenty of great things about life. Oh yeah? Name three. <laughs> Just three? That's easy as hell, man. In fact, I'll do you one better. In honor of the upcoming Valentine's Day, I'll give you three pairs. That's, that's really not necessary. There's having a big bowl of popcorn while watching a movie, having a cup of coffee while reading a book, and listening to music, like Gorillaz, with today's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon is an audio brand that provides amazing audio quality at half the price of other premium brands. All with the perfect in-ear fit, thanks to their super comfortable optimized gel tips that actually stay in your ears. Wait, do you hear through those ears? Are those functional? Uh, I don't know, probably. Eh, works for me. Music is one of the great joys of life, and with Raycon's eight hours of playtime, along with 32 hours of battery life thanks to the charging case, you can enjoy your music as long as you want. So if you're like me, you can drown out the world in noise isolation mode and get that workout in while listening to Poppy, switch right to awareness mode to do some chores with Rina Sawayama, and finally, hop back to noise isolation to take a load off with Tame Impala. Hmm, and you're saying this will free me from the existential dread of reality? Yeah, I, I mean, you should probably get some therapy too, but... The Raycons can't hurt. Huh, well, yeah, okay, that works. Whether you're a puppet or a real boy, you can get 15% off your Raycon purchase, plus free shipping by clicking the link in the description or going to buyraycon.com slash deadmeat. All right, bye. All right, bye, Puppet James. Uh, let's get to the kills. The movie begins with one of my favorite horror themes. <laughs>
Charlie's brother Richard Band composed this score, the same guy who brought us that banger theme for Reanimator. The Reanabanger! It's 1939 in Bodega Bay, California, home of the Matte Painting Hotel, or sorry, the Bodega Bay Inn. A puppet man, nay, master, resides here, Andre Toulon, currently making Jester purdy and alive. Oh, so beautiful. Oscar nominee William Hickey worked just six hours playing Andre Toulon. Four years later, he'd go on to voice Dr. Finkelstein in A Nightmare Before Christmas. Ooh, burn again! One of his puppets, slash upside down Steadicam Ops, sees that the Nazis have arrived. Not the Nazis! It runs back inside and through the hotel without most of these Muppet babysitters seeing it. This POV puppet is Blaine, and we love him, folks. Well, this lady doesn't, but she's wrong! Look at the little guy! With a warning from Khan, who will disappear after this scene, Toulon knows to pack up his puppets before these Nazis are at his door. Blade arrives just in time to join the luggage, and the trunk is stashed away in a secret wall hole. The Nazis get to his room, but Andre escapes them on his own terms. Sorry not sorry, Nazis! Get used to losing! Fifty years later, in the present of 1989, four psychics assemble at that very same Bodega Bay Inn. They believe they were summoned here by the spirit of their friend Neil Gallagher, who died recently. Since we have a body on display, and he is indeed dead, I'll go ahead and put him on the count. They meet Neil's widow, Megan, whom they didn't even know existed. Somebody married Neil? They learned that Megan inherited this hotel when her parents died two years ago. Neil promptly married her and tore the Bodega Bay Inn apart looking for Andre Toulon's secrets. The inn is played by the Castle Green Apartment Building, which was built in 1898 and isn't seaside at all. It's actually an old Pasadena in Los Angeles. An image of the building was simply superimposed onto a shot of an oceanside cliff. Once upon a time, this group of psychics helped Neil track down the ancient Egyptian power of giving life to figurines. First, there's Dana Hadley, whom the others call the White Witch. I prefer to think of myself is a nasty bitch. Her day job is giving sham readings to marks at carnivals. That gives us some cool carnival b-roll, though it's not as cool as a 31-year-old Barbara Crampton doing a quick little cameo. She's getting a reading alongside her then-husband, David Boyd. If you want to see me and Barbara hanging out every week, check out the Scream Dreams podcast, which is co-hosted by Catherine Corcoran from Terrifier as well. While describing fake visions, Dana had a real vision right in front of them, and that led her here to the hotel. Frank Forster and Carissa Stamford are psychic researchers of the sexy kind. I want you to recreate in your mind your wildest sexual fantasy. And it ain't just ponytail being horny on Maine either. Carissa's whole thing is feeling sexual energy in places. Oh my god, Frankie. What? This is a moody star bed. And finally, the dude rocking my hairline is Alex Whitaker, an anthropology professor at Yale. His power is having prescient dreams, including a Neil nightmare that left him with belly blood on his mind and leeches on his mind belly. So yes, these people do have actual psychic powers. Like Alex can feel on photos and get dreamy visions with crappy hard lighting. Dana wonders how they didn't sense that their friend Neil had died, but it ain't because the dude's not dead. He stick a fork in him dead, or at least a hairpin. While they ponder that conundrum, they discover Neil was a monster. Carissa senses that he raped a woman in this elevator. Oh man, I hate how much Neil's face here looks like John Flansburg's in the Anna Ang video. God, and that noise he's making? <laughs> I don't sound like Flans. <laughs> Puppet Master's weird-ass screenplay went through many changes. At one point, the group of friends was a coven of witches. While producer Charles Band came up with the title and some of the puppets, the original script was written by Kenneth J. Hall. Hall is a writer and effects artist who would go on to design that sack of snow shit Jack Frost and the animatronics in Willy's Wonderland. He was also part of the OG Critters crew. Band then hired David Schmoller to direct Puppet Master. Ten years prior, he had made the awesome tourist trap. Little girl. Schmoller rewrote the screenplay using an alias named after Pinocchio author Carlo Collati. He added elements like the group's psychic abilities and all the, uh, bondage stuff. He also requested that Blade's face be modeled after Klaus Kinski since he found the actor difficult to work with while shooting 1986's Crawl Space. It seems like there's some acrimony between the writer, the director, and the producer, with Hall upset over Schmoller's script changes and both men accusing Band of not properly compensating them for the project. Not that I've received any, any money uh, for that over the years. I've been basically discarded. I guess this movie's like the first Friday the 13th in more ways than one. Teresa the housekeeper don't like having these weird psychics in the hotel. Maybe she's got a thing against taxidermy good boys. But housekeeper Teresa ain't gonna have to care for long, thanks to Pinhead the coffin stuffer puppet. He grabs a fire poker and kills her with a single flack to the head. Don't worry T, I'm sure that blood will sizzle right off. Things are strange irrespective of the killer puppets too. Neil's body is popping up in weird places, giving his widow a headache. Good thing she didn't see the shadow puppets right behind her. Dana thinks Neil's spear 
spirit is coming to kill them all and warns Alex to protect himself. I guess the chicken foot blood does the trick, since this POV puppet runs all around him without ever raising so much as a blade. Man, I hate how much they use the puppet POV. I want to see Blade, not see what he's peeping through those puppet peepers. What is he looking at anyway? Oh, <laughs> again with that dog! Frank and Carissa busy themselves, having ghost orgasms in the tub and or dressing up like the weird kid from New Year's Evil. They embark on a, quote, sexual experiment. Wonder if they had to apply for grants. Actor Matt Rowe there has been on this show before, talking to a different deadly doll. What's your name, buddy? Chucky. <laughs> Blade takes a gander with his P.O. Vuppet, and the little guy likes what he sees. Wow, he even bloody birthdays the show with Tunneler. Hope he's getting plenty of quarters for it. As Frank tunnels into Carissa, Tunneler enters the room. This Driller Killer puppet was modeled after Italian fascist Benito Mussolini, which is slightly less weird when you consider all the Nazi fighting sequels later on in the series. Carissa hears something and goes to check it out, then holds her face below the bed long enough for Tunneler to charge at and kill her. How? By tunneling, of course! She dies with a red right hand. Frank is left tied up and blindfolded, leaving him at the mercy of Leech Woman! Yeah, her name is Leech Woman! She's a woman who hacks out leeches. That's her power. She has the curves of a woman, she will walk like a woman, and at the same time, she'll spit up a leech. Other puppets are equipped with various weapons or are big strong, but leech lady eh, just pukes out leeches. It is the most ineffective method of murder I've ever heard of, but it still kills Frank, y you know, somehow, like eventually. The movie doesn't stay with the scene long enough for us to see it, but I mean, to be fair, film stock's expensive. Neil's body ends up in Dana's room next, maybe to see what the fuck's going on with her and that stuffed dog. She doesn't shake out any answers for him though. Really, she just blows smoke up his ass. She gets her calves attacked by Head and his big old giant man hands. The injury leaves her crawling down the hallway like the most useless person ever. And Pinhead easily catches up so he can, <laughs> what, just, just punch her in the face? Get out of here, Pinhead. Going, going, gone. Blade shows up and Data briefly escapes him on the elevator, but he catches up through the ceiling hatch. He kills the psychic lady with his little knife hand by slitting her throat. And her death has an audience too, an excitable jester who's pretty pleased with what he sees. The film's puppets were created by an actual puppet master, the late David W. Allen, who was Oscar nominated for his effects work in Young Sherlock Holmes. He pulled from all sorts of inspirations for the designs, including Italian comedy and French Grand Guignol theater, German expressionism, and Renaissance art. I love how varied and interesting they all look. For all the drama surrounding who's responsible for what, I think a lot of this first film's success is due to Alan's work. He and his team used several techniques to bring the puppets to life. There were animatronics engineered by Mark Rappaport, who would go on to do effects work in movies like 300 and I Am Legend. There was stop motion, which proved to be quite quite time consuming. That 12 second shot of Pinhead in the coffin took two days to create. And of course, there were, well, uh, puppets. And even that was complicated. One character could take up to five people to operate. Several versions of each puppet were built for different purposes, including stunt puppets that could get the shit beat out of them. And for Pinhead, actress Cindy Sorensen both puppeteered and played his meaty hands. Those were her fists punching Dana in the face. <laughs> Alex is woken up by Megan, who takes him to the hotel's abandoned upper floors. Inside a white ballroom, she dances with Neil, clad in a crappy knockoff phantom mask. They dance for freaking ever while Alex just watches until Neil takes out a gun. <laughs> Horror journalist Nat Brever, a guy who literally wrote the book on this franchise, compares this first film to Italian genre films. It has a dreamlike, surreal tone, where random things seem to happen, just like in a lot of giallos. Hell, Dana's vision seems to be directly inspired by a similar one in Deep Red. Puppet Master looks the part too, thanks to Italian cinematographer Sergio Salvati. He was a frequent collaborator of Lucio Fulci, and shot films like City of the Living Dead, Zombie, and The Beyond. Alex wakes up from his dream safe in bed. What's happening, Alex? Okay, Never mind, he was still asleep, but he wakes up from that dream safe in bed. But then he has the same exact experience his dream foretold, Megan knocking on his door and leading him to the hotel's abandoned upper floors. I get that Alex's power is precognition, but do we really have to watch all of this shit again? I mean, we're just padding at this point. I I'm starting to get American graffiti off. That 10 minute intro was bad enough. Instead of showing him a ballroom, Megan shows Alex the journal of Andre Toulon. Like my other puppets, they mirror the soul of their master, and with me they are harmless but I fear what they are capable of if placed in the wrong hands. Wrong hands like that bastard Neil Gallagher! Alex and Megan find the corpses of the other psychics set around the dinner table in all their dead and tunneled glory. Then they're confronted by Neil Gallagher in the flesh, here with an army of candles and a whole bunch of puppets. Honestly, way more candles than puppets though. That, that's a lot of candles. Neil confirms that he did indeed die, but now he's back, baby, and not in pog form. Using the techniques of the old puppet master, I brought myself back to life. Thanks to his resurrection, now he can live for 
forever! And since he's mastered it for himself, he doesn't need to play with puppets no more. Oh shit, don't throw Jester, dude. You'll break his face. And the other puppets will remember that. Also, looks like they don't approve of domestic violence. Neil starts molly whopping Alex, but soon enough, Pinhead the Puppet starts molly whopping Neil. He gets locked inside the elevator with the puppets he's betrayed, and they're ready to tunnel an apology out of him. He tries to escape, but they're about to put a pin in that plan. Blade cuts off his fingers, getting embalming fluid all over the carpet, and then all the puppets descend on him with stabs, more drilling, a sensual temple massage, and of course the leeches. Sure, leech woman, get in there with your weird shit too. She orally craps a blood slug into his mouth, the final little salty insult before a neck snap kills Neil Gallagher. Again, glad to see that guy go. What? Why are you two crying? That dude was an asshole. <laughs> The next morning, Alex leaves? What the fuck, man? I thought you were trying to get with this chick. The movie ends with Megan in the hotel by herself, save for Dana's stuffed dog, Leroy, who suddenly finds itself reanimated. Okay, how many strings of life were cut by a group of deadly puppets? Let's find out and get to the... <laughs> I counted seven kills in Puppet Master, with the victims consisting of three women and four men. Uh, well, three men, but Neil died twice. Anyway, that gives us this almost even puppet pie chart. This count in gender breakdown has been seen seven times before on this show, with five of those occurrences during sequels. I found that mildly interesting. With a runtime of 89 minutes, Puppet Master had a kill on average every 12.71 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Neil Gallagher the, the second time. Even though his death ultimately came at the hands of a neck snap, he ran the whole gamut of puppet punishment down to the ineffective leeches. Dom Machete for lamest kill will go to Neil Gallagher the first time though, since his friends walked in and, you know, he was already dead in a casket. And that's it. Puppet Master was released direct to video in 1989 and was called one of the best movies of the year by Joe Bob Briggs. Yeah, checks out. Check it out. If this episode does well, I'll look at the sequels, at least some of them. But next week, we're taking a trip to the boardwalk with the Lost Boys. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been the Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Puppet Master Kill Count. We finally did it. Yeah, so about that full moon thing, they've got a Patreon slash loyalty club with a ton of different tiers of rewards. I was seriously impressed with what they were offering. There's behind the scenes stuff, there's exclusive articles, there's exclusive access to shows. Higher tiers include stuff like monthly Blu-rays and merch like shirts and tote bags. And the highest one even has producer credits available for you. But Charles actually hit me up and told me to make an offer to Dead Meat fans. So this offer is good for the month of February. The first 100 people who sign up at the $10 tier and mention Dead Meat, they'll get a code to get a free Tiny Terror figurine. These are like blind box items. There's uh, uh, there's at least 10 little figures. For Puppet Master, they got Tunneler, they got Leech Woman, and they got Blade. There's also the Ginger Dead Man, uh, Six Shooter and Torch from the other Puppet Masters, Baby Oopsie Daisy from Demonic Toys and Jack Attack, and uh, Eby, uh, the Evil Bong. I really like them. They're nice and cute. And one of them can be yours for free if you are one of the first 100 people to sign up at the $10 tier and mention Dead Meat when you do. I thought that was a really cool thing, so thank you, Charles, and thank you all for watching. I'll see you next week. Be good people.